spot of cloud there. You see, no? Well, nothing up my sleeve. You ready? One, two, three, go on. My word. Pick out the Queen of Heart. This one. Right. Now, the Queen of Heart. This one. That one. Oh, try again. Now, there she is. Where is she? Um, Check it out. What are the ingredients that go to make a great actor? It's always a mystery, but in Ralph Richardson's case, his instincts, which can't be explained, are backed up by a high degree of literary intelligence and a strong visual sense. He loves the business of acting, the clothes, the props, the make-believe of it all. In fact, his feelings about acting seem to stretch back to early memories and the games of childhood spent along the coast from Bognor. I was rather a lonely child, in fact. My mother and father, I had two brothers, but my mother and father separated. They didn't divorce, but my mother left, and she took me, the youngest, with her. We, we found a little bungalow to live in Shoreham by Sea. My father was an art master at Cheltenham. A very romantic bungalow it was, too. I don't know if there's any like it now. It was made up of two railway carriages, with all the compartments and a tin roof dividing them in between. So we had a big room in the middle and about 20 bedrooms, well, 15 bedrooms on either side, all with their own locks, you know, just as if they were real railway carriages and the windows that you wound down. And of course, it was a kind of dreamland for a child because it, but I had very few companions. It just happened we didn't know anybody there. And I did spend a great deal of time walking about, climbing the groins, by myself. And I was afraid of the sea. I'd never jumped from as far from the sea. I'd never, it frightened me very much. And I remember nearby, in a bungalow near us, there was this extraordinary man in those days, the champion wrestler of the world, George Hackenschmidt. A person that I don't know whether many people have heard of now, but he was an enormously powerful man. And he had a gymnasium there where he used to train. And this rough, tough man, Russian, about six foot six tall, took a sort of fancy to me when I was about four or five. And he was so gentle and so sweet, I almost took the place of my father, who I didn't know very well. And he used to say, are you afraid of the sea? And I said, I am. He said, you're quite right to be afraid of this. It's a very frightening thing unless you take care. He said, would you like to go shrimping? I said, I don't think much, George. He said, you wouldn't mind going shrimping with me, would you? I said, how do you mean? He had one of these very big shrimping nets you know, that the professional shrimpers have. And he said, you wouldn't mind sitting on my shoulders while I went shrimping. And I remember the shrimping day, sitting on his shoulders, he ploughing with his majestic strength through the water, and then picking them up and taking the shrimps, and then saying, now let's go home and eat them. <laughs> and then one of the most delicious dishes I can ever remember in my life, he gave them to his cook, who made a huge omelette straight away on a fire, he put these shrimps right out of the net and mussels and things, 
third of all round, he said, now, how's that for going swimming around there? <laughs> Can I ask you about school? Did you enjoy it? Not at all. No, I thought you might... No, no. When I did go to school, I was a great failure at school. I didn't like anybody and nobody liked me. I remember the headmaster one day telling me why he didn't like me, exactly what was the matter with me. What was it? Great pity I forgot. <laughs> it might have done me a great deal of good if I could have remembered. <laughs> Find the light. Yes, I have a look at this one. Are you a young man of this state? Oh, yes, sir, that you came to and watched shows in? Oh, my goodness me. The set I started in in Brighton wasn't half as grand as this, <laughs> or half as big. It's quite a big auditorium. It's a fascinating little theater. You saw lots of variety shows, various things around here. When I lived at Brighton, yes. I had a marvelous time. Who did you see? Did you see? All the old boys? Oh, it's all, all the old boys, yeah. Sixpence in the gallery. Elevenpence early doors, which I used to treat myself to sometimes. Murray Lloyd? Oh, yes. Do you feel George little... Roby, of course. Little yeah. Titch. Little Titch. Oh, Little I've Titch. I've seen film of him. Silent film that they dug up from the Paris exhibition. He seemed in link with a completely different tradition. Well, it always astonished me that Little Titch, in one way, was one of the most highbrow actors you can imagine. For one thing, you, you know, he was a tiny little man. Tiny little man. Just wasted. And he time. had, yes, very frail little figure. With a most marvelous voice you ever heard in your life. Like a little lamb. And I'll tell you one thing about little Titch. Jack Priestley was a very great admirer of Titch. <laughs> when Priestley was a brat, so he said, he was a, a journalist at that point. He was sent round behind the stage to perhaps interview Pitch, make a little uh, some notes for his local paper and he, he tells me and of course Pitch was his great hero <coughs> he tells me that as he was standing in the passage rather nervously waiting there on one door was a star and Mr. Pitch he thought my goodness Pitch is behind that door and a call boy came along knocked him off yeah. Mr. Pitch Mr. Pitch! Walked away. Door open. Yes, I'm Education, I didn't, but uh, I thought one. Well, I thought I'd like to be a chemist. But it was a kind of dramatic. I saw myself being very effective in a white coat, serving very mysterious things out of very weird bottles, and having a great. But then you see, I asked about being a, uh, a chemist, and they told me the exams I'd have to pass and the knowledge that I'd have to have to be a dispensing chemist, and it, it flawed me. It was too much for me. <laughs> I went to the Brighton Herald when I was a boy. I said, I'd like to be a journalist. to think I could when I left school. And they said, well, I said, no, you, you might. But they said you'd have to 
What would I have to have? Well, they said you'd have to have shorthand and typing. You'd have to have that, essentially. So I thought, hmm? Could you have? So I bought a book, Pittman's, the guide to the easy guide to Pittman's shorthand. And I took it back with its circle and its curves and its angles. And I studied it. And I studied it. And in the end, I had to throw it away. I thought I could never be a journalist. I could never learn the Pitman's easy shorthand. So that was another uh, word, dream I'd given up. So you had to really find a job. Yes. Well, which then didn't I, involve well, learning. That, that's <laughs> it. I did. And I was an office boy at the Liverpool and, uh, Liverpool and uh, Victoria Insurance Company at Brighton for a long time, earning there the prince's salary of ten bob a week, indeed. I did feel I was a very rich and princely man. I always felt that. I never had any. I was very poor when I was young, but I never felt that at all. And uh, my mother never felt that she was poor. We used to uh, we used to feel it was up to us to set a sort of tone and give certain subscriptions to people. And all on two pound ten a week. We had uh, when we went to church. We went. My mother said it with us. We always had her visiting card placed in the pew. You had letter-headed notepaper? We had crested notepaper. Whenever I was absent from school, my mother would write, because I was always absent from school, because I was always ill or swinging the lead, and my mother would write a letter on with, with our, would do, in fact, like have crest, but few people use a crest, two pound ten a week. We always lived in a rather grand and rather snobbish sort of way in that way. And we always felt ourselves to be millionaires. We'd sort of give to the poor, sort of thing was utterly ridiculous. By a timely piece of luck, Richardson was suddenly bequeathed 500 pounds to be used solely for his education. With, with the money for my education, I, I wanted to become a painter. I always wanted. My father and my mother were painters, and I was brought up with the smell of turpentine in the house. And my natural inclination then, my natural thought, was to try to be a uh, an artist. And I went to the art school for some time, but I was no good at it. I loved the idea of it, but I, I, I was a great failure there, and people told me, don't, don't go on with this thing. My drawing, really, instinctively, was not very good. I've got some of my drawings now, still, in a, in a portfolio. They're, they're pretty rotten. And, as I say, I used to go to the theatre a great deal. And I think, really, if you ask me, I don't sure whether you did ask me, but <laughs> the, the, the turning point in my life, where, when I really discovered I could or make a start as a, still another profession, was when I went to see Benson play Hamlet. Benson was a very good Hamlet, and I thought then, I still think, that he was indeed a very magical actor. There was just one thing he did. When the ghost appeared, the ghost said to Hamlet, Revenge, revenge. And Hamlet drew his sword. He put the sword on the ground. He drank across the stage where he was strange and yearly noise. He drew it up as if it was sharp. He said, Revenge. Now this little bit of business struck me as being something wonderful. There's something that isn't written in by Shakespeare, it's just invented by him. And I thought, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to learn. I'll never be clever enough to paint or to draw or to illustrate books. That was rather a kind of sort of thing. But maybe I've got it in me somewhere to illustrate literature by acting. Maybe one day I could invent something like that. Fired with enthusiasm and armed with the remains of his 500 pounds, Richardson discovered in Brighton a semi-amateur company of players run by someone called Frank Grocott. Of course, when I went to him, I said, I'd like to be an actor. I'm a millionaire. Well, the you... sort of actors he wanted to attract, I think, weren't they? <laughs> he said, come inside and let's talk this over. But he said, really and truly, Richardson, well, actor, well, what acting have you done? Well, I said, none. Well, he said, that's not a very good recommendation for any part, is it? No, but I said, I can make myself useful in the theatre. I can make myself useful anywhere. 
what do you think? Can you light? Can you really? Can you wire lights? Do you know between? Can you wire lights in circuits? No. But he said, I don't know. He said, can you paint scenery? I said, yes. He said, can you really? Oh, I said, I'm a brilliant artist. You know, I spent a very, very long time at the art school in Brighton, where I was a very great success to come in back. And so we arranged uh, a contract that I paid him 10 shillings a week for six months, and then if he kept me on, he paid me 10 shillings a week for the other six months. I, I said, well, when, when do I start? Well, she we started every week. Well, I said, yes, we have. She said, it's time to get down to the set, isn't it? I said, yes. She said, of course, yes. Uh, what, what do I do? What part do I play? She said, you don't play a part. He said, indeed, literally, I started not on the stage, but under the stage, because he was playing a, a, a play of, a, a wartime play. And the Zeppelin raid was meant to take place. And he said, all you do is, and thank goodness you come, because the Zeppelin did this up. I'm very glad to have you with us. And he said, you go under the stage, you take these two petrol things on a strap, and on the queue, you bang with petrol on that little wood. He said, they can spend the boy. Finally. I said, when, when do I get the queue? Do I hear the queue, or do I? No, it's very simple. He said, when I step, when I step with my heel on the stage like right that, they won't know. That is the cue for you to follow the petrol. He yeah. was a very short little man. He knows a very arrogant, very short. And in order to sort of give himself power and poise, he wore very, very long heels. The stage was very thin. And Grocott didn't know his lines very well. He never did. But when he didn't know his lines very well, he didn't know that he was doing it. Every time I heard the tin, I walloped the bed for him. I walloped the tin when the Zeppelin was miles and miles and miles off in the play. It didn't appear to the last act. So it made a rather bumpy start for me, but as I say, at the bottom of my profession, in every sense of the word. Yeah. And you kept your side of the I, I kept the first six months. After the first six months was over, I decided it was safer to leave. And uh, there, there always came, there came a great many visiting companies, and there came a chap there called Charles Dawes, who had a Shakespeare company, which, uh, traveling about, the ten plays in the repertoire, and ultimately I, I joined him. He was playing at Eastbourne, so I heard. So I cycled, I wrote to him, and he said, yes, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, an audition. So I cycled over to Eastbourne that momentous day and waited for him until the play was over, which was The Merchant of Venice, and the dresser said, come inside, the governor will see you. So he said, I understand that you've been uh, in repertory at Brighton, and you'd like to join my theater. He said, well, can you, can you, can you, besides that, can, can I hear, can I hear? He said, yes, no, I, I, I didn't see, I said, do. He said, stand over there. So, you see, I, I, I stood over there. He was sitting where you might be, taking his makeup off, the Sherlock, and here, hanging on the, uh, 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 against the wall, were his street clothes. You see, and all kinds of, and I stood there. And well, he, he said, well, start, and I started up, you know, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears, I come to bed, it's easy, I'm not so crazy. And I went off. John Dawn was sitting, listening to me, just as you might be, but he wasn't looking at me, he was looking at me through the mirror. Mm. Ah, then I said, ah. He was all old enough, this man. I told you how it goes. You were old enough, this man, but I remember the first time the season ever put it off. He was in a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the nerves he had. Our friends, seeing what a wrench the envious cat conveyed. Through this, the well beloved Brutus snapped. And as he plucked his cursed feet away, mark how the blood of Caesar was rushing out of doors to see if Caesar thus unkindly called or no. Ah, on a fall was there, my countrymen. Dorothy said, Stop, stop. Stop, Richardson, for God's sake. Oh, I 
Oh, boss, isn't any good? If he's rich as he's fine, he's fine, but look, you're messing up my trousers. <laughs> Years later, after you'd achieved your own personal success on the stage, did you ever get the chance to meet Charles Dora? as a kind of successful pupil after having had to despair of you and his days. Oh, yes, I think there was. Old, old Dora, you know, he lived on. Old, old, old Dora was over 90, you know, he lived for a bit. And I think he lost a leg or something. But he was all right. He was, some people were looking after him. And I was playing at, yes, I was. I was playing at the Phoenix Theatre. And he had a friend who looked after a bit in the nursing home. And he said, old Dora, would I come and see you? I said, does he still remember me? Oh, he said, indeed he does, and he'd like to come to the matinee. Oh, I said, that's wonderful. He said, would you like to see him afterwards? I said, well, of course, I'd be delighted to see him. But as I say, I was just making up and putting on this, this uh, uh, toupee that they had, and they, someone came in and said, look, Charles Don doesn't think he can wait till the end because we've got the car for him, and he said, could you go, could he see you now? I said, well, of course. But they said, I said, could he come up the stairs? No, they said, but he's at the stage door. Yeah, yes, I said, come on, where is he? I'll, I'll, I'll come down and see him. So I ran down the stairs, and there was Charles. Great big moon face, really didn't look any older than I hadn't seen him for 30 years. And I, went up, I said, oh, Charles, how nice to see you. He looked at me for a moment, he didn't say any expression, and he said, well, what a beautiful wig joint. <laughs> Oh, it was rather sweet, because in the days with him, you know, we wore these very early Willie Clarkson wigs. <laughs> joints. it was simply terrible. Nothing. His only comment. Was it was his only comment after yeah. 30 years. <laughs> I don't expect you to be able to answer this question, Sir Ralph, necessarily, but what is the trick of acting? Well, of course, when, when, I, was, when I was young, I had a lot of theories about acting, you know. I've always got a, a new trick or a new theory. I often think that uh, perhaps I haven't got so many now. I always had an idea. In fact, uh, I was thinking the other day, rather like a chap, I, I've got a whole cupboard, cupboard full of discarded tricks, like you could have a whole cupboard full at home of alpine stocks and hooks and ladders uh, and tricks that you thought were going to help you to get up over the mountain. I had a lot of tricks. And, you know, I, ideas. They were kept on show. I know the way to do it is this, or the way to do it is that. Well, I used to think at one time, for instance, I know, we, before you go on in this part, I've got to pretend to be a bee. I was, I was thinking I'm a bee. If I thought I was a bee, I'd, I'd be all right in this part. So sort of silly things like that. You know, I can't tell you how silly the tricks that I say that actors think of. I don't say it's a trick, but what I think it is, it's partly dreaming. It's partly daydreaming. You see, acting, isn't it? It's, it, it's make-believe. And to make people believe, you've got partly to believe it yourself. Not all the time, but some of the time, in each play, you really believe that it is really happening. You know you, I mean, you're acting enough to know that's true. So in a way, it is forced dreaming to order. The curtain goes up at eight. So at eight, precisely, you must partly dream. And so I think that it, you must somehow to be able to... It isn't the subconscious, it's the... It's a forced dream, that's all, if I can make that clear. And, yes, for a time, you do forget, for a moment, you do forget entirely where you are. You really believe, is this your love? You, you really believe that for a moment. Not the same place at every moment in a performance, but part of it. It's getting a hold of this subconscious, I suppose. And that's why, in a way, the repetition of a, of a part for a player it's such a very trying experience. People say, but how do you manage to do it every night? Exactly the same. How do you manage to do it? Well, we say it's very hard to do it, but I tell you where it's particularly hard, and you know this really as well as I do. But a recurring dream is a very awful experience. You know when you wake up 
and you're in a dream, and you wake up, and you go back and see if it's the same dream again. And this is very frightening. You don't seem to be able to escape from it. Are those your gloves? Yes. You've got a pair like that at home. Yes? Oh, they're nearly... The seam goes the other way, I, I think. Yes, yes, it does. <coughs> the present. My wife. Oh, yeah. At Christmas. Season of good cheer. Less and less, of course, these days. Oh, dear, man. The whole thing's absolutely ruined. More than money intrudes, all feeling goes right out of the window. Oh, yes. I always thought these woods were particularly beautiful. Always caught my imagination. I've been coming here on and off for years. But I tell you one thing. These woods are haunted for me. Haunted by the ghost of the terrible Father Christie. Who's that? Father Christie is a ghost to me. I tell you, he's the vicar, or was, of Swindon Church. When I was a little boy, living in the bungalow I told you about with my mother, you know, by the seashore, with these two, I sold an orange in the house. So my mother said to me, did you steal an orange? I said, no. She said, you did. You're a very wicked boy. I tell you what, you've got to be beaten. So I said, oh, yes. He says, and Father Christie is going to beat you, and you're going with my, your nurse, and you're going to Father Christie's to be beaten. And she took me by the hand, and she led me along like that, you see, yeah. to the church. And I, duplicitous as ever, said, look, Nanny, what's out there? And she looked out there. <laughs> and I did a bunk. And they came behind the tree or something. And she couldn't find me. <laughs> and she went home, you see. Yeah. And they said, well, where's Ralph? You've lost. She said, I've lost him. I was only about this size at the time. Well, I waited for about an hour, and then I turned out. And one said, oh, Ralphie, where have you been? Oh, darling Ralphie. They've quite forgotten that I was the orange tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why these woods are haunted, as I say. I wonder if the terrible Father Christian He's still alive, waiting there with his horrible cane. These little children. <laughs> I know, uh, Sir, up up the midst of your career, you've, you've been involved with Shakespeare and the classics and all the English authors, if you like, but um, you've also devoted a great deal of your time to the modern writers and to the contemporary playwrights. Yeah. Uh, Priestley, Shaw, Osborne, Orton, David yeah. Story. But um, well, the earliest of these is Shaw. Yes, I, I had the pleasure of seeing quite a lot of them. I acted in one of his new plays, which he partly directed. And uh, I first met him when we were at the Old Vic, and we were doing Arms of the Man, which had been done in many times in Shaw's life, but he came along to rehearsal. And he was very helpful and splendid to us. I remember one thing he said to me, I don't know if you remember, I played Blunchley. Well, when Blunchley first enters, he climbs in through the window, of right in his bedroom window, he's shinned up the rain, the rain pipe, they've been shooting at him from outside, he's been off, running away from the enemy for about three or four days, and at last, with the enemy shooting at him, he makes it in his last desperate effort, and he bursts into the room. And I took a good deal of trouble trying to get this right. I arrived. I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was half asleep, as you meant to be. I was covered in blood. I was hard to speak. And Shaw came to me and uh, he said, you know that business that you do when you come in through the window and you're very exhausted? Yes, yeah, I said, that's what, what I've just done, you mean. He said, yes, yes, Richardson, it's very good. It's very good. It might be all right for a Chekhov play, but it's no good for mine. In my plays, he said, there's no time to wait for the text. You've just got to speak. Bang on. And he was right. 
a great play, in my opinion, which was offered to me, a play written, Waiting for Godwin, written by Beckett. There's a lot of, in it I didn't understand. So I asked Beckett if, he, if we could meet, because I'd like to understand these very complicated things. I made a little list of them. I said, Mr. Beckett, could you explain to me what happens when Pozzo says this, what it means? Well, he said, I, I don't know. Well, I said, I'd let that one go. I said, when I come on in the third act, I, do, I don't know why I come on in the third act quite. Mr. Beckett, could you explain that? He said, no, no, I, I couldn't explain that. Well, I said, uh, Mr. Beckett, if, if you don't understand, how am I to make the public understand? And like a fool, because I didn't understand the silent playwright then, I didn't do the play. Very great mistake, one of the greatest mistakes of my life. But then I thought later on, I acted in a lot of plays by dead authors, for goodness sake. I acted in Congreve, I acted in, in Shakespeare, for heaven's sake. People I don't know, they're all dead. I found a fine way to get on with living authors. Just pretend they're dead and plenty. You never had another word's trouble with them. Yeah. I'm sure if I painted a... If I were here to make a, 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 a sketch, if I were to make a drawing of where we're sitting here, it was a kind of impression to me. And then you came along, well, perhaps later, perhaps not, but I, you came along and said, what do you mean by that shadow, that tree going over there? What, what, is, what does it mean? I think I can very honestly say, I don't know what it means. It was an impression I had at the time. It was an excitement I had at the moment. I can't explain it. I think I was very foolish to ask these chaps to, to explain what they meant. <coughs> you know what I did want to ask you about was, we talked about writers. How did you get on with directors? Directors? With the same equanimity? Well, I don't take very much notice of directors. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> Since the not-so-successful days at the art school in Brighton, Sir Ralph has continued to paint on his holidays. The paintings are mostly hidden away in cupboards in his London house. He doesn't rate them very highly. William Nicholson, the painter father of Ben Nicholson, was a friend and encouraged his painting. Sir Ralph has some of Nicholson's delicate landscapes in his own collection. William used to was very nice to me. I used to go to his studio quite a lot. And he was interested in the painting that I was, paintings that I was doing, and uh, very generous to young people, extraordinarily generous. I remember I lived in, uh, in Harriet Walk then. It was near Lowndes Square. I had a little house. And outside the house was the back of it. It was a, an arch, an ornamental arch. And uh, I was painting this arch, and he asked me what I was doing, and I said, well, I'm painting the arch outside my house, you know? He said, yeah. I said, I'm, sometimes I painted from up here, which was my little study. But then I'm not quite certain of that. I said, I run downstairs, and from the dining room, of course, I, I look up at it. And then I run up again, and I'm not certain whether to paint it from this, all of that, I said, as a matter of fact, you know, I'm sort of combining the two versions in my little painting. I said, do, do you think it's all right for me to do that? He said, my dear Ralph, it's perfectly all right, perfectly all right. But Ralph, why run? <laughs> the still life is so beautiful. Being a marvelous little, little life of violence. You got a little. I always said, yes, that's the secret, those violets. No one must see that because it's, I'm paying them for my wife's birthday next week. It's a bit of a secret, those violets. Oh, I said, I think it's one of the most beautiful things we've done. It's a bunch of violets stuff. It drops of water on them. You buy violets, you know. Little drops of water. That's astonishing. That's beautiful. What a charming idea. My goodness, yes. Hmm. 
Having thought of that, I took a hair and rubbed them out. He said, I must do those again. There. Kerry's hobby he had was walking down Bartlett Square with him one day, on the way to his studio. He said, ah, that one. So he stooped down, something in his pocket. And so when they got to his studio, he said, what, what, what was that? He said, Fun, he was sweet. What was it? He said, oh, what is it? It was a lady's healthy. Maybe this is more than they do now. Oh, yeah, it's a nice one. He opened the drawer. He's got bundles on it. Hung up with elastic bands, you know? Bundles of ladies' hairpins. He picked up. Which one? Curious Holland. I really the hobby I've ever heard of, I think. <laughs> well, he's a great ladies' man. <laughs> books are sort of dope to me. I have to have books. Not content to, not clever enough just to sit about doing thinking. Not a single thought comes to my mind, I get tightly bored. Can you get the feel of a book from the outside? Like oh, that? yes. Indeed. This is not a badly bound book. What's the But you see, it's an, absurd, it's, it's an absurdity, really. Well, you see, this book, by these notches here, yeah. which are meant to be the cord on which the book is sewn, yeah. and the classic number of cords to which you sew a book are indeed five. Yeah. Well, this is rather a well-bound book, you see. As you can see, the sections here, it is actually bound yeah. on five cords, you see? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. But they're not the cords that are represented here because these are in quite a different place. Yeah. You're what Coleridge calls a library cormorant, dipping below the surface. Dipping into everything. I mean, you've got a very well, Catholic taste in books. Oh, yes, I have indeed. Who are the authors you read voraciously and probably go back to again and again? Well, I suppose my sort of, uh, if you call it a, well, speciality to myself, I suppose perhaps it's Conrad. Yeah. I've read Conrad and Stevenson are my sort of favourites, perhaps. Yeah. I've read them over and over again. You read the whole of Conrad? Oh, yes, I think I have. Is it the sea and the feeling for the sea that you've well, taken I out of it? I don't think it's the subject. It's just the, the wonderful dreamy way of writing. Mm. What you the narration of one story and another story behind that. Three or four depths of consciousness, which I find so fascinating in Conrad. Mm. And just the sound. What wonderful titles they are, Conrad, up to the heart of darkness. The outcast is the island. Yeah, I think it's just a style which captivates me. Mm. I'm absolutely captivated by the style of Henry James. I've read the whole of Henry James, which is quite a few people. Well, he wrote quite a lot. And there's something about reading the whole of an author's book. I take it up as a bit of a challenge, if you like, a bit of a hobby. But uh, it's rather like getting to know someone very well. You appreciate, if you just read the best in Henry James, you don't appreciate it nearly as well if you've gone through some of the long, dreary things which happen perhaps in companionship. It makes you get to understand the chap a great deal more. Yes, well, I like cars very much, but I'm not sure I'm that keen about books on cars. So this is rather an interesting Rolls Royce, that's called the Sedanka. The first one I had was like that, this back is false. It doesn't really let down as this indicates it will. Mm. But there's a solid piece that comes, draws forward, fixes it, fixes it completely, a solid front, you wind up the window. So it's something that never caught on afterwards. Mm. How many Rolls Royces have you owned? I suppose about ten altogether. Mm. Change them rather quickly. 
I'd love to ask you about your two great friends, Lawrence Olivier and Sir John Gielgud. I was going to ask, how, how do, do their characters relate to their performances, do you think? Well, Lawrence is a very bold, very daring man in his own life, in his own personal life. When we were young, we were both very keen on motor cars. So we used to go out driving together a lot, to drive to Oxford and tear all over the place in our car. Once he took me over the Croydon crossroad, crossroads of Croydon, the London and Croydon bypass. He approached the, the crossroads at about 50 miles an hour. He made no effort whatever to slow down. As he got to the crossroads, neither looking right nor left, he accelerated to about 75 and took me over. He said, it's a great thing, Ralph, if you meet a point of danger, get over it as quickly as you can. So I said, the wisest thing. I said, why or not? I said, I never could do this. I was never thought about it. I know I'm risking my life like that for nothing. A little while later, he, that was in my car that he was driving. A little while later, he brought a car back from America, a new American car. Did you drive that car? Well, I got in at Piccadilly and I drove down Piccadilly to Marble Arch. I did 75 miles an hour. He said, that time, Ralph, I knew you'd get something out of her. Well, this extraordinary daring with fearlessness in his own nature, which he's had since uh, all his life, goes into his work, the success, and he's able to produce an excitement on the stage, which is very rare. Tremendous sense of danger. Yes. Yeah. And he's very, very daring in his characterization. And this uh, is one thing. Now, John and Gilgut, if you were to compare them, is, I would say, and I think that he would agree, personally rather a timid man. I mean, he's not timid in his work, but he doesn't like, he said, no, I've never learned to swim, for instance. For instance. And uh, he, he, physically, he's... He, different to myself. Although his courage in his work is fantastic. When he, uh, I was with him at the Old Vic when he, when he played uh, King Lear for the first time. And uh, we had to work pretty quickly in those days, you know, for rehearsal. And uh, his King Lear was assembled, imagine uh, uh, the assembly of, of, a, of, a, of a post, of a part of that size. And he found at the first rehearsal, the first dress rehearsal, it wasn't working very well, he changed the whole thing for the next rehearsal. Now that's a boldness, an interior boldness, which few people could dream of. Are you nervous on the stage, Sir Ralph? Ha ha! Very. <laughs> it's, it's meant to be a, 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 a... As I was saying, they're meant to be averted to this. Uh, I didn't really have that virtue. I'm very nervous. Yes. Um, what else were we saying about acting in general? Just thinking about, in about the films. About the, yeah. um, the yes, about the films, yes. The funny thing about the film, any kind of atmosphere, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to being allowed to play in a number of films that I have been allowed to play. I never made much of a mark in films. I was never what you might call a film star. But the curious thing is, though, it may be something to do with the hours that one spends, because one spends so many hours in the, in the film studio, you get there very early. But when the, when the day's over and the director says, right, it's a wrap-up, I'm out like a rabbit. Between the way of getting from the studio, I, I'm half undressed. By the time I get to my dressing room, I'm throwing the things to the dresser. I've got that on, and the four, and I'm away because I've got to get out. Moment, boys, it's a wrap-up. 
What a joy it is. More joyful, rather, than the bell comes at school when I was a boy with that. Mm -hmm. The curious thing, though, in this stuff, when the surfer comes down, when the curtain comes down and you go up to your room, you sit there. And you eventually say to your brother, well, I'm going to make a great effort of will. I'm going to get up. And on the way down to the stage door, very often you find yourself, this is one wrong thing. I often do. Quiet now. The audience is gone. You walk about on the stage and think of such a mistake you made in the movement. You don't want to leave it. In the theater, there's a sense, it's rather like, like after a meal, there's a sense of fulfillment after playing a part in the there's yeah, a sense of fulfillment, even though it hasn't been a good show, you've done. It's rather the difference between between eating a meal when afterwards there's a sense of fulfillment. You just want to sit by the table for a while. You don't want to get up. Or eating a ham sandwich in a railway station. You don't want to bite it and go <laughs> I can't express it, but that's the difference. Yeah, there's... Yes. Brother-in-law, who was an artist, Really? Would have appreciated those flowers, light, fading, clouds, wonderful things. Oh, yes. I should like to have been an artist myself. Musician. Really? Flute. Beautiful instrument. Oh, yes. Shadow. Choose any card. Any? Any one. Eight of diamonds. My word. Right? Absolutely. Intended to show the ladies. Another day. Oh, yes. Again. Any one. Uh... Four of space. Two of hearts. What? 